Welcome to show seven of Reading Radio. Normally, I'm KWCW 90.5 FM Walla Walla, but today podcasted from my house in Seattle. It's spring break. I'm Julian Weller. And I'm Grant Purdue, and we're here to read you kids' books, as usual. For the next Some hour. <clears throat> and today, we are going to be reading The Story of a Bar by Jean de Brunhoff, and Some then I will read your... Guys from Space by Daniel Pinkwater, which... My mom just reminded me that we had, and it was given to me by some family some friends when I was like five months old. So this will be a crazy trip down memory lane. And then Julian will continue chapter, gosh, I guess it's chapter seven of Who Could That Be at This Hour? Part of the All the Wrong Questions series by Lemony Snicket. And I will continue chapter five Where of Harry Potter gone? and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Yeah, it's looking like a good show. But before we get started... We should note that my friend Kai Hirayama, who is also on spring break, will be playing piano in the background for some atmosphere for our songs. It's go- going to be quite delightful, as you can already tell. Mm-hmm. So we're going to begin our night with The Story of a Bar by Jean de Brunhoff, a classic little French tale written in 1933. In the great forest, a little elephant is born. His name is Babar. His mother loves him very much. She rocks him to sleep with her trunk while singing softly to him. Babar has grown bigger. He now plays with the other little elephants. He's a very good little elephant. See him digging in the sand with his shell. Babar is riding happily on his mother's back when a wicked hunter hidden behind some bushes shoots at them. The hunter has killed Babar's mother. The monkey hides, the birds fly away, Babar cries. The human turns, runs up to catch poor Babar. Babar runs away because he's afraid of the hunter. After several days, very tired indeed, he comes to a town. He hardly knows what to make of it because this is the first time that he has seen so many houses. So many things are new to him. The broad streets, the automobiles and buses, However, he is especially interested in two gentlemen he notices on the street. He says to himself, Really, they are very well dressed. I would like to have some fine clothes too. I wonder how I can get them. Luckily, a very rich old lady who has always been fond of little elephants understands right away that he is longing for a fine suit. As she likes to make people happy, she gives him her purse. Babar says to her politely, Thank you, madame. Without wasting any time, Babar goes into a big store. He enters the elevator. It is such fun to ride up and down in this funny box that he rides all the way up ten times and all the way down ten times. He did not want to stop. But the elevator boy finally said to him, This is not a toy, Mr. Elephant. You must get out and do your shopping. Look, here is the floor walker. Babar then buys himself a shirt with a collar and tie, a suit of a becoming shade of green, then a handsome derby hat, and also shoes with spats. Well satisfied with his purchases and feeling very elegant indeed, Babar now goes to the photographer to have this picture taken. And here is his photograph. Babar dines with his friend, the old lady. She thinks he looks very smart in his new clothes. After dinner, because he is tired, he goes to bed and falls asleep very quickly. Babar now lives at the old lady's house. In the mornings, he does getting up exercises with her, and then he takes his bath. He goes out for an automobile ride every day. The old lady has given him the car. (laughs) She gives him whatever he wants. A learned professor gives him lessons. Babar pays attention and does well in this work. He is a good pupil and makes rapid progress. In the evening, after dinner, he tells the old lady's friends about all about his life in the great forest. However, Babar is not quite happy. 
for the, he misses playing in the great forest with his little cousins and his friends the monkeys. He often stands at the window, thinking sadly of his childhood, and cries when he remembers his mother. Two years have passed. One day during this walk, he sees two little elephants coming toward him. They have no clothes on. Why, he says in astonishment to the old lady, it's Arthur and Celeste, my little cousins. Babar kisses them affectionately and hurries off with them to buy them some fine clothes. He takes them to a pastry shop to eat some good cakes. Meanwhile, in the forest, the elephants are calling and hunting high and low for Arthur and Celeste, and their mothers are very worried. Fortunately, in flying over the town, an old marabou bird has seen them and comes back quickly to tell the news. The mothers of Arthur and Celeste have come to the town to fetch them. They are very happy to have them back, but they scold them just the same because they ran away. Babar makes up his mind to go back with Arthur and Celeste and their mothers to see the great forest again. The old lady helps them to pack his trunk. They are all ready to start. Babar kisses the old lady goodbye. He would be quite happy to go if it were not for leaving her. He promises to come back someday. He will never forget them. They have gone. There is no room in the car for the mothers, so they run behind and lift up their trunks to avoid breathing the breathing the dust. The old lady is left alone. Sadly, she wonders, when shall I see my little Babar again? Alas, that very day, the king of the elephants has eaten a bad mushroom. It poisoned him, and he became ill, so ill that he died. This was a great calamity. After the funeral, the three oldest elephants were holding a meeting to choose a new king. Just then, they hear a noise like that they turn around. Guess what they see? Babar arriving in his car, and all the elephants running and shouting. Here they are! Here they are! Hello, Babar! Hello, Arthur! Hello, Celeste! What beautiful clothes! What a beautiful car! Then Cornelius, the oldest of all the elephants, spoke in a quivering voice. My good friends, we are seeking a king. Why not choose Babar? He has just returned from the big city. He has learned so much living among men. Let, no, let us crown him king. All the other elephants thought that Cornelius had spoken wisely, and eagerly they await Babar's reply. I want to thank you one and all, said Babar. And before accepting your proposal, I must explain to you that while we were traveling in the car, Celeste and I became engaged. If I become your king, she will be your queen. Long live Queen Celeste, long live King Babar, Cry all the elephants without a moment's hesitation. And thus it was that Babar became king. You have good ideas, said Babar to Cornelius. I will therefore make you a general, and when I get my crown, I will give you my hat. In a week, I shall marry Celeste. We will then have a splendid party in honor of our marriage and our coronation. Then turning to the birds, Babar asks them to go and invite all the animals to the festivities. And he tells the, the drum dairy to go to the town and buy some beautiful wedding clothes. The wedding guests begin to arrive. The drome dairy returns with the bridal costumes just in the nick of time for the ceremony. After the wedding and the coronation, everybody dances merrily. The festivities are over, night has fallen, the stars have risen in the sky, King Babar and Queen Celeste are indeed very happy. Now the world is asleep, the, quest of the guests have gone home, happy though live tired from the too much dancing. They will long remember this great celebration. And now King Babar and Queen Celeste, both eager for further adventures, set out on their honeymoon in a gorgeous yellow balloon. The end. That was the story of Babar by Jean de Brunhoff. Alright. Way to struggle through the tiny, tiny cursive letters. It was, it was a little difficult, but I made it. Pocket edition. And if you're just joining us now... Mm -hmm. On our podcast. On our podcast. This is... Maybe you walked into the room and your friend was listening to it. The craze sweeping college campuses everywhere. This is reading radio, typically on KWCW, but we are on spring break and we are podcasting to Live. your computer. To your computer from my living room. And hopefully to your living room. <clears throat> now it's time... 
for a book called Guys from Space by Daniel Pinkwater. Okay, Guys from Space by Daniel Pinkwater. To Charles, a cat, even though he threw up on my computer printer. I was in the backyard. I wasn't doing anything. There was something in the sky. I looked up. There was something big up there. It was not a bird. It was not an airplane. It was not a balloon. It was not a cloud. It was something from space. It was neat. It was coming down. It was coming down into the yard. It did not make a noise. It landed like a dream. This is good, I said. I was not scared. When the thing from space had landed, a little door opened. Guys from space came out. They were no bigger than me. Is this Chicago? They asked me. This is my yard, I said. The guys from space talked to each other. Kid, would you like to come for a ride? No, I said. You don't want to come? No. It will be fun, the space guy said. We will bring you back. Nothing doing, I said. You will be the first Earth person to ride in our spaceship, they said. I'm not allowed to go with anybody, I said, unless my mother or father says I can. Are your mother and father the same size as you? The guys from space asked. Bigger, I said. Then they will not fit. Just you come. I have to ask my mother, I said. Is she scary? The space guys wanted to know. Not very. All right, ask her. Where is she? She's in the house, I said. Wait here. I went inside the house. My mother was in the basement. She was weaving. She weaves. She was weaving some sort of rug. She has this loom. It's what you weave on. There's some space guys in the yard, I said. That's nice, my mother said. Is it all right if I go up in the spaceship? Sure, my mother said. Do you want to see the space guys? Not now, dear, my mother said. I'm just doing the hard part of this rug. Then I can just go with them? If you aren't late for supper. I'll see you later, I said. Have a good time, my mother said. I went out into the yard. She says I can go, I said. Good, the guys from space said. Get your space helmet. I don't have one, I said. No space helmet. That's too bad. Don't you have an extra one? I asked. Afraid not. Then I can't go? Well, you have to have a space helmet. Oh, I said. Maybe we could fix something up. What's that? That's the dog's water bowl, I said. What's that stuff in it? Water, I said. Could you dump it out? They asked. I guess so, I said. Would that work as a space helmet? Mm, try it on, the space guy said. I tried it on. It's cold, I said. How does it look? It looks good, the space guy said. Come on. Why do I have to wear this, I asked. You have to, it's a rule. Let's go. We went through the little door. The space guys turned knobs. They pushed buttons, they switched switches. Something buzzed, something beeped, something whistled. Here we go, the space guy said. Look out the window. I looked out the window. We were going up. Isn't this neat, the space guy said. We were going fast. Where are we going, I asked. Well, we'll visit some other planet, the space guy said. Will I be home in time for supper, I asked. What time is supper? Six. Easy. I thought other planets were far away, I said. They are. How can we go to another planet and be back by six? Easy. We go fast. Hold on. The spaceship went faster. It went very fast. It went very, very fast. It went faster than sound. It went faster than light. I didn't like it. This is too fast, I said. Never mind. We've come to a planet, the space guy said. What planet is this, I asked. Who knows? Some planet, the guys from space said. Let's get out and look around. How do you know if there's air on this planet, I asked. If there's no air, you can't breathe, the space guy said. Then what? I asked. And then we run back into the spaceship and close the door, the guys from space said. How about wild animals and bad people? I asked. Same thing, we run back inside. It sounds simple. 
We're space guys. We know what we're doing. The space guys opened the door and went outside. The air is good, the space guy said. I don't see any wild animals, I said. No, this is a good planet. We can tell, the space guy said. What do we do now, I asked. And we look around. We explore. We looked around. It was a neat planet. There were a lot of rocks. I picked one up. Put me down, the rock said. I put it down. The rock talked, I said. Hello, rock, the space guy said. We like your planet. Who are you? The rock asked. We're guys from space, the space guy said. We're just visiting. Oh, that's all right, the rock said. Look around and have a nice time. Thank you, the space guy said. Is there anything special here? Something we should see? There's a good root beer stand, the rock said. Oh, good. We like root beer, the space guy said. Do you like root beer? They asked me. Sure, I said. Where is the root beer stand? They asked the rock. It is there, behind that big rock, the rock said. We went to the root beer stand. It was nice. It had lots of lights. Space things were drinking root beer. There was a big space thing in the root beer stand. He was ugly in a nice way. Five root beers, please, the guys from space said. You have money, the big space thing said. We have plastic fish, the space guy said. We use plastic fish for money. Plastic fish are fine, the big space thing said. Five root beers for five plastic fish. On our planet, we get ten root beers for five plastic fish, the space guy said. Do you get ice cream in the root beers? The, space, the big space thing asked. No, we never heard of ice cream in the root beer, the space guy said. Five plastic fish for five root beers with ice cream, the big space thing said. The space guys gave the big space thing five plastic fish. Ice cream and root beer, they said. What a strange idea. The big space thing gave us the root beers with ice cream. This is good, the space guy said. We will teach the people on our own planet about this. I drank my root beer. I ate the ice cream with a spoon. I looked at the space things having root beer. It was good root beer. Hurry and finish, the space guy said. We have to go? I asked. We want to go to our own planet. We want to tell our people about ice cream and root beer. We want to go back and tell them before someone else does. You will take me home first, I said. Yes, now finish your root beer and ice cream. I finished my root beer and ice cream. We got into the spaceship. The space guys took me home. We landed in the backyard. Do you want to come in? I asked the space guys. Do you want to meet my mother? Not now, the space guy said. We want to go home. We want to tell our people. You want to tell them about root beer and ice cream? Yes, our people will like it. We will be heroes. Thank you for the ride and the root beer, I said. You're welcome, the space guy said. Goodbye. Goodbye. The spaceship took off. I went into the house. Why do you have the dog's water bowl on your head? My mother asked. I used it for a space helmet, I said. Fill it with water and put it back, my mother said. The dog may want a drink. Then wash your hands and face and come to dinner. I took a ride in a spaceship, I said. That's nice, dear, my mother said. Did you have a good time? The space guys bought me a root beer, I said. I hope you thanked them, my mother said. I did, I said. The end. That was Guys from Space by Daniel Pinkwater, maestro, kids book writer. Now before we continue with our longer chapter book section, we are going to have a song break. Mm-hmm. And this week's inspirational song break Here's a song is called Fibber Island. Island by They Might Be Giants. Check it out. Here on Fibber Island, we strum rubber guitars. Our friends live on Mars, and we sew buttons on our cars. Here on Fibber Island, our house is made of pie. Our dog is two miles wide. And all he talks about is pie. Here on Fibber Island, we swim on the ground. Wheels are square, not round. We eat chocolate by the pound. 
Here on Fibber Island. Here on Fibber Island. No one sings along. No one sings along. We just ride giraffes. We just ride giraffes. And wear bicycles for hats. Bicycles for hats. To get to Fibber Island. You just close your eyes. Start fibbing in your mind. And see what you can find. Here on Fibber Island we had mittens in our hair. You might need to stare to see the mittens in our hair. Come to Fibber Island and strum rubber guitars. Meet our friends from Mars and sew buttons on our cars. lovely acapella version of Fibber Island is on They Might Be Giants YouTube podcast. Here come the 123s or ABCs. It's one of those. Anyways, they have a whole great album called No, full of kids music. Now it's time for Who Could That Be at This Hour? By Lemony Snicket. Chapter 7 of the chapter book we've been reading. Last week, a ton of stuff went down. With Moxie Malahan's help, Lemony Snicket stole from the Malahan Lighthouse the statue of the abominating beast and lowered himself on the cable hawser running to the Salas mansion, only to notice the officer's Mitchum's police flashlight shining in the window of the library, and rather than be caught, well, I'll read the last couple pages of chapter 6. Sure enough, I could see the faint shape of the open window right where the hawser ended, and in the middle of that shape was a faint light. Hydrophobia, I thought? No, Snicket, that's the fear of water. The light did not look like a candle, as it was not flickering, and it was bright red in color. A bright red light reminded me of something that I also could not quite remember. Agoraphobia, I thought. No, Snicket, that's the fear of wide open spaces. We're almost there, Theodora said. In a minute, the abominating beast will be returned to its rightful owner, and this case will be closed. I did not answer, because it had come to me all at once, like a light turning on. It was the red flashlight the officers Mitchum had on top of their car, and acrophobia was the word for a fear of heights. I let go of the hawser and fell straight down into the trees. Chapter 7 <clears throat> It was pitch black everywhere around me, and I felt as if I had fallen into the path of an enormous shadow. I had learned how to do it in what you would probably call an exercise class, but that doesn't mean it wasn't difficult or frightening to fall that way. It was difficult and frightening. The fall was quick and dark, and I landed on the tr- in the tree on my back, with many twigs and leaves poking at me in annoyance. <clears throat> Still, I felt it. Then I relaxed, as I had been trained to do, and lay out on top of the tree, letting it support my weight, but I still felt the enormous shadow cast upon me. It was not the shadow of the hawser or of any other trees nearby. It was the face that appeared next to me, the face of a girl about my age. I could also see her hands clutching the top of the ladder. She must have leaned against the tree. Somehow I knew, as she blinked at me on top of the ladder, that the girl in question had already begun to cast an enormous shadow across my life and times. That was quite a stunt, she said. Where did you learn to fall into a tree like that? I've had an unusual education, I said. Did they teach you how to get down? The best way is to wait for someone with a ladder. Someone, she repeated. Who, exactly? I don't know, I said. I don't know her name. Hello, she said. I'm Ellington Faint. And I sat up to get a better look at her. It was not so dark that I couldn't see her strange, curved eyebrows, each one coiled over like a question mark. Green eyes she had, and hair so black it made the night look pale. She had long fingers with nails just as black, and they poked out of a black shirt with long, smooth sleeves. And right before she started climbing down the ladder, I saw her small, shadowy smile in the moonlight. It was a smile that might have meant anything. She was a little older than me, or maybe just a little taller. I followed her down. 
When I reached the ground, Ellington faint looked me over and then brushed a few leaves from my collar before offering her hand. The statue felt solid against my chest, and my hands were a little raw from the hawser. I could not see Theodora above me. It was possible she did not even know I was no longer behind her. You haven't told me your name, Ellington said. I shook her hand and told her. Lemony Snicket, she repeated. Well, follow me, Mr. Snicket. I live in that white cottage you passed over. You can rest there from your flight. She led the way through the trees to the cottage I had seen from the road and from the hawser. Curiously, it looked even smaller now that we were close up, with a few windows here and there and a creaky-looking door and a white brick chimney puffing gray smoke into the night. The small arch over the door read Handkerchief Heights in faded letters. They say a washerwoman used to live here, Ellington said when she saw me looking at the sign. She used to hang handkerchiefs out to dry in the backyard and gave the cottage its name. Who lives here now? I asked. Just me, she said, and opened the door. The cottage was no more than one small room, and most of that room appeared to be a fireplace with a colorful fire lighting every corner. The crackles of the fire mixed with music in the room, music I'd never heard and liked very much. There was a small cot in the far corner with some rumpled blankets and pillows, and a large striped suitcase open on the floor with all sorts of clothes tossed all sorts of ways. I spotted a long, fancy evening gown, some heavy hiking boots, an apron that a chef might wear, a red wig, a long zippered green tube that might have been a purse, and two small hats I'd seen on the heads of Frenchmen in old photographs, both dirty, both worn, and both the color of a raspberry. On the opposite corner were a small sink and a short wooden table completely bare with one st stool tucked under it. Sitting on a windowsill was a dented pair of binoculars, and on the floor in the center of the room was a small box with a crank on its side and a funnel on top. It took me a moment to realize that it was an old-fashioned record player, with the music I'd never heard before winding out of the funnel. The music sounded interesting and complicated, and I wanted to ask the name of the tune. There were no books in the room as far as I could see. I should have known better. Have a seat, Ellington said to me, gesturing to the stool. I'll make us some coffee. That should be restorative. Coffee? I said, my voice louder and higher than I'd planned. I don't drink coffee. What do you drink? Water, I said. Tea. Milk sometimes. Orange juice in the morning. Root beer if I can find it. But not coffee? People our age don't usually drink coffee, I said. Nor do they usually drop into trees, Ellington said. I guess we've both had unusual educations. I pulled out the stool and sat down, and Ellington busied herself at the sink with a metal coffee pot, rinsing it out, and then filling it with water before adding several scoops of ground coffee from a paper bag stenciled with the shadow of a black cat. Black Cat Coffee, she told me. Corner of Caravan and Parfait. It's one of the last businesses left in Staying by the Sea, and one of the only reasons I venture into town at all. She sighed. Mostly I stay right here. What do you do here? I asked. She gave me a small smile. You first, she said. Why are you flying through the air in the middle of the night? I reached into my vest and put down the bombinating beast on the table, a little too hard, so it made a loud thunk. Ellington glanced at it briefly and then reached for a pair of creaky iron tongs used for moving burning logs around in the fireplace. She used the tongs to pick up the coffee pot and held it over the flames before looking back at me. What is that? she asked. Some kind of toy? I took a long, close look at the statue for the first time. The abominating beast still looked like a seahorse, if a seahorse could be, na be a nasty, frightening animal. The eyes of the statue were actually small holes, as was the mouth, with, it, with its lips drawn back and the sharp teeth making thin lines over the hole. <clears throat> the entire statue was hollow, I realized, and for a moment I wondered if it had been carved to fit over a candle so that the fire might shine through the eyes and mouth to create an eerie effect. I turned it over to look at the base of the statue, which had a strange slit cut into the wood. There was a small, thick piece of paper pasted over the slit like a patch, patch paper felt curious to the touch, like the paper wrappings on cookies in the bakery. I shook the statue to see if, it, if there was anything inside, but it did not make a sound. I don't know what it is, I said finally. I've been told it's worth a lot of money. <clears throat> and someone's going to give you this money? She asked me, in return for your stealing it? Something like that, I said, remembering my promises. Then why did you drop into a tree? Something was going wrong, I said. What was going wrong? You'd know better than I would, I said. You were watching me the whole time. The coffee pot began to gurgle, and Ellington removed it from the fireplace and set it down, bubbling, on the table before fetching two cups and two saucers from a rack next to the sink. 
She poured two cups of coffee and let them steam in front of us for a moment on the table. The steam lingered in the air, along with the odd, jumpy music. It was dark out the window, but I knew had it been daytime they would, that we would have a wide view of the clusterous forest. Ellington grabbed a pillow from the cot and knelt on the floor before replying. How did you know I was watching? she asked quietly. I saw something glinting at me from the window of the cottage, I said, right where those binoculars are sitting. You were watching me and my associate on the hawser. Why? I've been watching this area for days, she said, and took a sip of her coffee. I left mine alone. It wasn't that I thought she had slipped laudanum into it. It was simply that I didn't like the coffee. I didn't even like the way it smelled, dark and earthy like soil, but Ellington smiled a little as she sipped. What are you looking for, I asked, and pointed to the abominating beast. This? She put down her coffee and smirked at the statue. The statue frowned in reply. I'm looking for something much more important than some silly statue, she said. I'm looking for my father. What happened to him? She stood up. Somebody took him. Some terrible man. My father and I lived together in Kildeer Fields, a town farther up the road a ways. I've heard of it. It's a nice enough place, Ellington said. Although something was going on that was bothering my father, I could tell. And then one day I came home from school and he wasn't there. He wasn't there by dinner time, and he wasn't there by bedtime, and in the morning, a man called with a fearsome voice. He introduced himself as Hangfire and told me I'd never see my father again. That was six months ago. I've been looking the whole time, and I'm beginning to believe that what Hangfire told me was the truth. She walked to the cot and reached under it to show me an enormous, messy pile of notebooks, newspapers, envelopes, and parcels. This is what I do, she said. I've been following any lead I can find. I've interviewed dozens of people. I've checked on hundreds of rumors. I've written letters and telegrams, made phone calls and knocked on doors. I've sent countless packages to people he knew, most of whom left Kildare Fields after the flood. I sent I sent photographs of my father, copies of articles he's written, anything that might help people tell me where he is. A while ago, I heard that Hangfire was hiding out here and stand by the sea. He chose a good location. With so many abandoned buildings, this town is full of hiding places. Yes, I know. I've been living in this cottage ever since, hoping for a glimpse of him. If I find Hangfire, I know I'll find my father. But this Hangfire person wouldn't just give him back to you. No. So what will you do then? Anything and everything. She told me and it made me shiver a bit. She'd thought about her answer. She hadn't just said it the way, the way most people said most things. Why would Hangfire kidnap your father? I asked her. That's the most mysterious part of all, Ellington said, and poured herself more coffee. My father never hurt anyone. He's a kind, quiet man. Two tears rolled out of her eyes, and she brushed them away with her smooth black sleeve. And he's a wonderful father. I've got to find him, Mr. Snicket. Will you help me? I had fallen out of one mystery and into another, and perhaps that was why I made another promise. This one is foolish and wrong as all the others. I'll help you, I said. I promise, but not tonight. Right now I have to leave. Thanks for the coffee. You didn't drink any. I told you I don't drink coffee, I said. But come find me tomorrow, and we can work together. I'm staying at the lost arms of my associate, S. Theodora Markson. What's the S stand for? she asked. But then there was a knock at the door. The clock above the fireplace told me it was close to two in the morning. Ellington looked at me and asked the question that is printed on the cover of this book. It was the wrong question, but when she asked it, and later when I asked myself. The right question in this case was, what was happening while I was answering the door? But when the hinges stopped creaking, I was thinking only of the officers Mitchum, who were standing there with matching, stern eyes. Aren't you the snicket, lad? Harvey Mitchum barked at me, while Mimi Mitchum barked, what are you doing here? I replied, yes, to the first question, and visiting a friend, to the second "'What sort of young man visits friends in the middle of the night?' asked the male officer suspiciously, sniffing the air and frowning. "'What sort of hanky-panky are you up to?' asked his wife. I replied, "'A friendly one,' and said, "'I don't know what you're talking about,' but I could tell these were the wrong answers. "'We need to talk to you, Snicket,' Harvey Mitchum said. "'There have been reports of a burglary. Somebody stole a very valuable statue in the shape of a mythical beast. Do you know anything about that?' "'I've always been interested in mythology,' I said." "'That's not what I mean,' he snapped. "'Your chaperone was hanging on the hawser and refused to tell us why.' 
It's still too early to make assumptions, Mimi Mitchum said, but I wouldn't be surprised if she's as big a criminal as you are, Snicket. I'd say she's a bigger criminal, her husband said. No, he is. She is. We can settle this later, Harvey Mitchum said with an annoyed look. Right now, we're going to search the premises for this valuable statue. Don't you need a warrant for that? I asked. This isn't the clusterous forest, the female officer Mitchum said, gesturing behind her back. This is stained by the sea, and we are the law here. Step aside, Snicket. I stepped aside, but not before looking behind me and seeing with relief that the abominating beast was not in plain sight on the table. Instead, Ellington Faint was in plain sight, holding her envelopes and parcels in an awkward pile in her arms. "'Good evening, officers,' she said. "'It's not good evening,' Harvey Mitchum said sternly. "'It's bad behavior. You should follow the example of my boy Stewie. He knows better than to stay up late. That's why he's sleeping in the car right now.' It keeps him calm, said Meany, and alert, said Harvey, and good-looking, added his mother. That's true, the male officer said. Stu Mitchum is as cute as a button. I tried to think of buttons I'd seen that liked to torture small animals, but I couldn't. Mr. Snicket, Ellington said quickly, will you help me with these parcels? I took a step toward her. Of course, Miss Faint. She smiled at the Mitchums. Mr. Snicket and I are about to take a walk to the mailbox to deliver these things. Wait until the search is over, Harvey Mitchum said, and we'll drive you there ourselves. Young people shouldn't be out at this hour, Mimi Mitchum said. The abominating beast might get you. That's a myth, I said. Ignore the bell and you'll find out, the male Mitchum said, and brushed past me to peer around the cottage. Ellington hefted a parcel into my hands that was about the size of a milk bottle. It was wrapped in newspaper, and I saw she'd hurriedly put a few stamps on it and scrawled an address. S. Theodore Marks and the Lost Arms Stained by the Sea. The officers began rifling through Ellington's things, and she and I stood at the doorstep of the cottage. "'Why didn't you address the package to me?' I whispered to her. "'I thought it would look suspicious if I were mailing a package to someone who was standing right next to me,' she replied. "'Is the mail delivery reliable here?' I asked. "'Yes,' she said. "'You should have it by tomorrow morning. Surprisingly, delivery around here is very fast.' I tucked the wrapped statue under my arm. I had been told that if I found someone suitable during my apprenticeship, I could recommend them to our organization as a new member. It was too soon to make that decision, but it didn't feel too soon to smile at Ellington as the Mitchums muttered to themselves inside the cottage until they gave up. We give up, Harvey Mitchum said. There's no statue in this cottage. I took one step, so I was standing outside. That's definitely true, I said. Well, thanks for stopping by. Not so fast, Mimi Mitchum said. We're driving you both to the mailbox and then home. I don't know what you ruffians are up to, but it's over for tonight. Get in the car and say hello to our adorable son. Ellington and I followed the officers Mitchum to their rundown station wagon and piled into the back seat where Stu was waiting for us with a sleepy yawn and a cruel smile. Lemony, he said in the friendly voice he used to fool his parents. It's so wonderful to see you again. I nodded at him, and he reached out his hand and gave me a hard pinch on the arm that the officers Mitchum did not see. Ellington saw it, though, and she reached forward herself and grabbed his wrist. Stu frowned, and I saw her fingernails digging into his skin. "'It's lovely to meet you, Stu,' she said. "'I just know you and I are going to be lifelong friends.' Stu made a high-pitched sound certain boys find embarrassing, and we rode the rest of the way in silence." When we arrived in town, Mimi Mitchum brought the car to a squeaky halt and watched as Ellington and I dropped our packages into a lonely, scratched-up mailbox. The hinges of the mailbox door made a rough, unpleasant noise, and I was reluctant to drop my package in. So you're reluctant, I said to myself. Many, many people are reluctant. It's like having feet. It's nothing to brag about. The package made a muffled clunk as it landed, and then we got back into the station wagon and drove the short, empty distance to the lost arms. I thanked the officers for the ride and gave Ellington a secret smile and a wave and Stu nothing at all. The lobby of the Lost Arms was empty, except for Prosper Lost, who was murmuring something into the telephone. I stopped for a moment by the plaster statue of the woman without arms or clothes and suddenly felt how tired I was. Yes, I said to her, I suppose I'm in trouble. I headed up the stairs to see. And that's chapter 7 of Lemony Snicket, Who Could That Be at This Hour? Chapter 8 continues on our way towards the climax of the book as we revisit 
the library and learn a few other things. N- now, if you're just joining us from your living room or your computer, we are in Julian Weller's living room, and we are podcasting this week's reading radio because of spring break and other assorted reasons. And now we will continue on with... <laughs> Mostly spring break, though, I hope. Mostly spring break. It's spring break. We are going to continue it's on... spring break. <laughs> with Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Where we left off, Harry has found out that he is actually a wizard, and Hagrid has set him away to a world of wonder and discovery and magic. And he is currently in Diagon Alley, getting things to prepare for school. He's been to the bank and he's gotten all sorts of money. And where we left off, Haggard was telling him about the different houses of Hogwarts. And that he just bought his books in a bookshop, Flourish and Blots, and he's looking at a book book full of curses. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the muggle world except in very special circumstances, said Haggard. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You did a lot more study before you got to that level. Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list. But they got a nice set of scales for weighing potion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecary, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell. A mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor. Jars of herbs, dried roots, and bright powders lined the walls. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs, and snarled claws hung from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn horns at 21 galleons each and a minuscule, glittery black beetle eyes, five newts a scoop. Outside the apothecary, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your wand left. Oh yeah, and I still haven't got you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get your animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'd be laughed at, and... I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. Well, get your an owl. All the kids want owls. They're dead useful, carrying your mail and everything. Twenty minutes later, they left Eliop's Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering, jewel-bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage that held a beautiful snowy owl, fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding just like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Hagrid gruffly. Don't expect you to have a lot of presents from them Dursleys. Just Ollivanders left now. Only place for wands, Ollivanders. And you gotta have the best wand. A magic wand. This was just what Harry had been really looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door read Ollivanders, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded purple cushion in the dusty window. Tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depths of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place, empty except for a single spindly chair that Hagrid sat on to wait. Harry felt strangely, as though he had entered a very strict library. He swallowed a lot of new questions that had just occurred to him and looked instead instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly right up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. "'Good afternoon,' said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped, too, because there was a loud crunching noise, and he got quickly off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. "'Hello,' said Harry awkwardly. "'Ah, yes,' said the man. "'Yes, yes, I thought I'd be seeing you soon, Harry Potter.' It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in here herself buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he would blink. The silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favored a mahogany wand. Eleven inches. Pliable. A little more power and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favored it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. 
And that's where... Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. You, powerful wand, very powerful. And in the wrong hands, well, if I'd known what that wand was going out into the world to do. He shook his head and then to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius Hagrid, how nice to see you again, Oak. Sixteen inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, very stern, suddenly. Oh, uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, said Mr. Ollivander sharply. Oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed he gripped his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well, now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Oh, not your arm, that's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit, and round his head. As he measured, he said, Every Ollivander wand has a core of powerful magical substance, Mr. Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers, and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons, or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course, you will never get such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realized that the tape measure, which was measuring between his nostrils, was doing this on its own. Mr. Ollivander was flitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr. Potter. Try this one, beech wood and dragon heartstring. Nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around a bit. But Mr. Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Oh, maple and phoenix feather, seven inches. Quite whippy. Try. Harry tried, but he had hardly raised the wand when it too was snatched back by Mr. Ollivander. No, no, here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, give it a try. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr. Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr. Ollivander pulled from the shelves, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry, we'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now. Yes, why not? Unusual confirmation. Harley and Phoenix feather. Eleven inches, nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He felt a sudden sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head, brought it swishing down through the dusty air, and a stream of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the walls. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr. Ollivander cried. <clears throat> oh, bravo! Yes, indeed. Oh, very good. Well, well, well. How curious. How very curious. He put Harry's wand back into its box and wrapped it in brown paper, still muttering, Curious, curious. Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr. Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr. Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather. Just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand. When its brother, why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The one chooses the wizard, remember. I think we must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. After all, he must not be named did great things. Terrible. Yes, but great. <laughs> Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr. Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand, and Mr. Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall, back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawking at them on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny-shaped packages, with the snowy owl asleep in its cage on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realized where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. 
Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger, and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You are right, Harry. You're very quiet, said Hagrid. <laughs> Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He'd just had the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed his hamburger, trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron? Professor Quirrell, Mr. Ollivander? But I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous, and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Vol... Sorry, I mean, the night my parents died. Hagrid leaned across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You'd have been singled out, and that's always hard, but you'll have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, as a matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him an envelope. Your first ticket for Hogwarts, he said. First of September, King's Cross. It's all in your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know how to find me. Uh, see you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the wind oh, window, but he blinked, and Hagrid had gone. And thus concludes Chapter 5 of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. And since that's such a nice ending point for Harry Potter, that's where we're going to stop for the night. But as you leave, we're going to leave you with one last song. Yes, this song will be good. And, oh wait, yep, if you have any books that you'd like to hear on Reading Radio read to you, you can go to rereywawa.tumblr.com, R-E-R-A-W-A-W-A.tumblr.com, and you can listen to us on the YouTube for show six. There's a couple shows on soundcloud.com slash reading radio. And sometime soon we'll have them all consolidated and sorted out in one place. Right. And when that happens, we'll let you know on Tumblr and on the air. So stay tuned. Thanks for listening. And here's Bobby McFerrin. I am my own walk, man. <laughs> I'm my own walkman. Uh, 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 uh. I'm my own walkman. Uh, 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 uh. I'm my own walkman.
Soulful beat. When you want to look cool. Baby saying, hey, how you get to walk like that? You say, well, I'm, I'm my own walkman. Walkman. 